friends, Aaron here, making a follow-up video from the video that I had done showing you my test results using an oxygen meter and a carbon dioxide meter. My apologies if you've watched that second video, well, third video, I guess. I, I forgot that I can actually hit the hold button on this when it's beeping, have it continue to show me even if it's rising or in alarm what my CO2 levels are but it won't beep anymore and I did not do that and so there's a whole lot of annoying beeping in that video and I'm sorry for that. I'm going to preface this by saying that I'm not a, I'm not a doctor and I'm not giving you medical advice. I'm just talking to you about what I've learned and my results and I'm going to preface all of this by uh, telling you a story about a dentist that we went to with our kids for about eight years. And uh, she's no longer in practicing because she has cancer. Uh, she was always in the x-ray room and the plaza that she worked in had a cell tower super low right there in the parking lot. Uh, the, uh, the levels of radiation that she was dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis were pretty scary. When Teresa first started going there with the kids, uh, I think it's kind of uh, a funny thing for somebody to be so uh, adamant about, but she was actually even sort of adversarial about uh, the fact that we weren't going to have our kids biting into that fluoridated gel. And uh, it was a couple of times, two or three times, I think at least, before she left Teresa alone about it. She just wanted to keep fighting with her about it. And Teresa actually brought a bunch of information for her, uh, showing the history of the fluoridation in municipal water, how fluoride products ended up in um, dental products, uh, you know, really good information questioning the efficacy even of fluoride for preventing uh, tooth decay, caries, uh, what they're called, um, cavities, and uh, of course, you know, uh, serious questions about whether or not fluoride is safe. She wouldn't even take the paper. Now this is a woman who would be considered an expert as a dentist and yet I would venture a bet that after she graduated from dental school that she didn't spend a single solitary minute researching fluoride and that the extent of her research when, uh, research when she was in dental school was you know reading what her textbook told her spitting that back out on a test and listening to what her professor told her. So she would be considered an expert, a person who, who maybe, you know, conceivably hasn't done any research into fluoride on her own whatsoever at all. Uh, compare that to Teresa and I who together have spent many, 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 many hours over the years looking into fluoride. From every angle we could look into it from researching it. I don't know. Is she really an expert? You can uh, judge for yourself, I suppose. The other quick point I wanted to make is just that we're not the sort of people, Teresa and I, we never have been individually and certainly not since we've been married uh, the last 16 years, uh, not since we've had kids the last 15 years, been the sort of people who just listen to what somebody tells us and then that's it. We might end up taking somebody's advice, and of course there have been times that we have, whether they be medical professionals or whatever. But we are going to make those important decisions after we've informed ourselves. And we're not people who are looking for information that only verifies what we already believe. We want to know the truth. And so you can believe me or not believe me, but we're looking into it from every angle we can. And uh, I don't like the expression, but I think it's one people understand. I often will play devil's advocate. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on the other side. I'll be the prosecution instead of the defense, and uh, see if I can present an argument on the side that we're not leaning to Teresa that she can't re refute, um, or that I myself can't refute. So. We were told once that Teresa should take a, uh, a pharmaceutical for gallstones. She didn't have a gallstone, but it was to deal with a skin condition that she was dealing with at a certain time. 
and the doctor couldn't tell us that he trusted his tests. He said exactly the opposite. We don't understand why the tests come back and tell us what they do or even what the meaning is. This is not an exaggeration. Uh, we don't even know why it works, uh, but people who take this uh, pharmaceutical tend to have ex uh, experience uh, relief from this problem. Uh, but then they even, with all of the uncertainty, they even went on to give us some warnings about what might happen at that time if uh, she didn't take the drug. So we looked into it. I studied up on the drug. I studied up on its drug trials and, uh, you know, what sort of litigation there has been, um, what, of course, the FDA has to say about it, what the drug company has to say about it. Uh, but let's just put those people on one side, okay? You've got the doctors, you've got the Food and Drug Administration, and of course, if you don't know this, people go work for these giant pharmaceutical companies and then go head up, you know, the FDA, and then they'll uh, go back to working for Big Pharma. And round and round that revolving door goes. And uh, so, you know, FDA, Big Pharma, that's the same thing. Uh, food companies like Monsanto and Tyson and FDA, you know, I don't know where you draw the line. The lines are very much blurred there. But those are entities that have something to gain from me believing that the drug is safe and not telling me the truth about it. And part of my research is coming across blogs. And I don't exaggerate, it might have been more than this, but I'm for sure remembering three separate blogs that were um, full of testimonies by a dozen, a dozen or more, in some cases dozens of people. Again, I don't want to exaggerate, but at least a dozen in each one, different people sharing not their own experience, most of them, there were one or two of those, but not their own experience on this pharmaceutical, but the experience of a loved one who is now deceased, and all of them, because their loved one had liver failure, taking this uh, pharmaceutical that they were told by their doctors and by the FDA was safe, by the drug companies was safe. And so ultimately, we didn't have Teresa take the drug. We researched the problem uh, ad nauseum. I mean, we had giant stacks of papers that we printed up so that we could talk to the doctor about it, and uh, we learned a lot. We were just uh, defining terms we didn't understand. Uh, I'm not gonna, okay, I'm gonna stop there because I go off on tangents. Anyway, the point is uh, we're not the sort of people who just, somebody tells, tells us go and we go uh, when it's, uh, it's an important question. We're gonna understand it. We're going to understand the consequences as best as we're able before we make that choice for ourselves, for each other, for our kids. And uh, this is no different for us. So somebody telling me that uh, in, this, in these unprecedented days that covering up our faces and restricting the air around our mouth is safe for people to do all day long every day, even at home now, where some people tell us we should do that, depending on who lives with us at home. Uh, although nothing like that has ever happened in human history, and we're being told that that's safe. Well, I want to understand that. I come across a video of a fella showing when he puts an oxygen meter here, out here in the open air, that it stays at 20.9 and then puts a mask on and it alarms and drops down in like 17% range. Uh, Del Big Tree on the highway uh, putting up a video that's now been removed by YouTube where he did tests, putting masks on his 11-year-old son and, and uh, testing it with a CO2 meter and getting some pretty eye-opening results about how much carbon dioxide was building up inside and behind those masks. It doesn't matter to me that I can read an article that I'm going to share with you telling me that it's safe, 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 safe. And this is just one of many, one of hundreds, that telling you that it's safe and just put the damn mask on kind of thing. Uh, but that doesn't work for me. You know, that doesn't work for me. I don't trust you, and I have good reason not to trust you. And you can think this is conspiracy theory. I've talked about it before. There was the Smith-Mund Act. It's no longer on the books, and that was a protection for us as U.S. citizens on U.S. soil, uh, making it illegal for our government agencies, for government agencies, I don't want to claim them, for government agencies to use propaganda against us. So that's no longer on the books. And if you have not taken the time to look into the people that own the handful of giant media conglomerates, if you haven't seen the compilations that people have done of 
hundreds of people in a news organization uh, that owns, you know, a number of, you know, dozens or hundreds of uh, local news stations across the country telling you how something's a threat to our democracy or something as, as, as benign as, you know, talking about buying gifts for yourself on somebody else's birthday or something. If you've not looked into this at all, uh, I don't know what to tell you. But believing what you're told in the media, just straight up believe in it. Uh, that's really foolish, in my opinion. I don't own a TV. I'm not soaking in this fear and this constant repetition and this beating it into my brain and the technology that affects my physiology and my metabolism, uh, making it so that I'm actually using less energy than I would be if I was laying down in a dark and quiet room doing literally nothing, shutting down the uh, critical thinking part of my brain while I'm watching television and having these things repeated over and over and over and over again. I'm not doing that. Now I read, you know. I read enough about what's being said from whatever side, if you want to put it that way, to know what's going on, but I'm not being indoctrinated by it. And I'm looking into it for myself and for my family's sake. And so part of that for us is to spend over $300 on meters and accessories so that we can do these tests for ourselves so we can know. I'm not trusting somebody else is putting out a video showing that they did it. I wanna see it for me. And I have, I have done these tests multiple times, at least a half a dozen different times I've sat down with multiple different masks. I've done dozens and dozens of tests with dozens and dozens of things. Different kinds of fabric. I've done tests just to see how the CO2 level rises in our room when we all gather together as opposed to when we're all not in that room or when we're cooking or driving around in, our, in my van. You know, when I first get in it, what's the CO2 level? And then after I've driven, you know, 20 minutes, what's the CO2 level? I've made a mask out of an aluminum screen and out of mesh made from organic uh, cotton linen uh, with some really surprising results. You probably wouldn't even believe it. So I'm not even going to show you those results because you think that my meter is, is faulty. But, you know, this thing is reading 450 to 500 and something, depending on where it is. Here in the suburbs, it's better. In the city, it's worse. Uh, is, it, is it accurate? I think it's close. I think it's good. It's certainly not defective. It's not malfunctioning. It's sensitive. If I sit out, and I've read that this is the way these things work. If I sit out on the sidewalk and a few cars drive by, the CO2 level will go up a little bit. It's noticeable. You can see it. Uh, so this is stuff I've done for me to understand. Is it safe? I don't care what somebody tells me. So here's just one particular article that I think is particularly ridiculous from the Daily Beast, but this is just one of many. I, I'm scratching my head, shaking my head, rolling my eyes, constantly reading this stuff. Pilar Melendez from uh, Daily Beast writes, and she quotes a doctor in here, which is the part that I'm just going to jump down to. Now this is the uh, author writing myth, masks can cause carbon dioxide poisoning. Well, we're not even explaining what they mean by carbon dioxide poisoning. We can experience uh, a toxicity. We can experience elevated levels of CO2 in our blood, and that actually happens pretty quickly. I've done this video a couple times, had a whole bunch of files get corrupted, and then I just take too long and I feel like I need to start over. So I might be repeating myself, but our body will retain a little bit of CO2 sometimes by regulating our breath so that that changes our pH level. That's how our, our metabolism is, is regulated, or one of the ways that our metabolism is regulated by our body. So the change by not allowing uh, that, uh, that gas exchange between carbon dioxide and oxygen to happen, you know, completely or whatever, you know, kind of keep it retaining, holding on to a little bit of CO2 with a shallower breath or whatever it may be. I'm not trying to get into all that. I've thought it out and I believe I understand it, but um, that change takes place pretty quickly, that, that raising of the level of CO2 inside the blood to, uh, to adjust our metabolism. So what are we talking about? Uh, carbon dioxide poisoning. You mean like acute respiratory acidosis or uh, being poisoned to the point where you're breathing in 10% or 100,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide and you drop dead and die? Well then, if, yeah, of course, it's a myth. They don't lead to carbon dioxide poisoning. But what do we mean by poisoning? 
even if this isn't flat out lies, which some of it I think is, but we'll get into it, it's certainly misleading. While masks can be uncomfortable, they aren't airtight. True enough, they're not airtight and therefore can't hold the carbon dioxide that's created during respiration, cellular respiration, not uh, inhaling and exhaling. So cellular re respiration is where the carbon dioxide is coming from and then we are expelling it through our exhalation. They can't hold it. Well, no, I suppose they couldn't hold it indefinitely. If you took one big breath and then exhaled into a mask of any kind and sealed it up some kind of way and uh, would the carbon dioxide escape from the mask? Of course it would. But we're going to talk about why that's not honest. Can't hold it. Masks, even the N95s used by healthcare professionals that have smaller pores than their cotton counterparts also do not deplete oxygen levels, contrary to claims in one viral meme. Maybe there's one viral meme, but there's certainly more than one instance where somebody is showing you that oxygen levels are depleted. I'm going to read to you what OSHA says about depleted oxygen, and I am telling you that I have done this for myself, so we'll get into that. And then the author goes on to say here, Michael Peel, talking about a pulmonologist somewhere, I don't care where, he tells the Daily Beast that even long-term use is unlikely to produce levels of carbon dioxide that could build up inside a mask. That could build up inside a mask. And, but he's only saying it's unlikely. But we'll see about that. Now, uh, quotes from the doctor. So in a face mask, the carbon dioxide is going to pass right through and we're going to inhale fresh air through that. Through the mask, I suppose he means, although that's not clear. So there's really no opportunity for carbon dioxide to build up inside the mask to harm us, Peel said, calling the myth illogical. It's illogical to think that CO2 could build up around your face if you've restricted that air exchange, that airflow. Totally illogical according to the doctor. He also noted, here's straw man alert, who nobody's saying this that I've seen ever at any time anywhere. He also noted that CO2 doesn't cling to masks and therefore can't be re-inhaled. So because it's not clinging, like Velcro to the mask, you can't inhale it? If it's, if it's built up in the space, free flowing in this restricted area and not clinging to the mask, you can't inhale it because it's not clinging to the mask. Like that doesn't even make any sense. Even if it did, it would be a very small amount, the physician added, but the fact is that it just doesn't happen that way. So says the doctor. All right, now I am going to read at least from one place, but I have more than one. Uh, I want to make the point about this. That if you look up the dangers associated with certain carbon dioxide levels and you find information from 2020, from our new normal, you're probably going to find what I've found and that you're going to see this idea that, you know, up into the 10,000 range, they might mention that pff, totally fine, nobody's gonna have a problem with it. It's really kind of the way that it's presented and that they'll jump right up to 50 to 80,000 parts per million, five to 8% of the air that you're breathing being carbon dioxide, try to remember those numbers. Uh, that's when you might have a problem. And even then, some of the things that I've read that have been put out in 2020, you know, frankly, for what reason? To push an, a particular narrative? You know, they downplay the dangers of breathing in five to eight percent uh, carbon dioxide. So I'll read that stuff, but I'm looking for things that have been published prior to January of 2019, and of course you can guess why. So here's one, dangers of CO2, what you need to know, and an article that was published in June 4th of 2019. Carbon dioxide is a natural gas found in our atmosphere, of course, colorless, odorless, tasteless, tells us about the volume of air. We'll get into that. I'm not going to talk about that just yet. And talking about breathing in carbon dioxide. Here's one of the places I've found where we're told how much carbon dioxide we actually exhale. And in this article, it talks about 3% CO2, which would be 30,000 parts per million is what we're breathing out. I've seen numbers as high as 40,000 as being what the average person is exhaling, 40,000 parts per million. Now, again, that's not every breath. Sometimes we're retaining a little bit, we breathe differently, so, but 
I think it's fair to say that an average, we're breathing out 30,000, we won't even use that bigger number. As we're breathing, not in an open air environment, okay, if we're, if we're not in an open air environment, then our oxygen is slowly being converted into CO2. The oxygen level, uh, oxygen level falls as the CO2 level rises. This is just uh, this is the way that works. The, the CO2 level is going down if we're in there breathing because we're taking in the oxygen and using it and we're, ex we're, we're breathing out oxygen, you know, 16%, something like that I've read, but we're taking in 21% breathing out 16% the oxygen in outdoor ambient air is around maybe 500 parts per million that's what we're taking in if we have good air in uh, in a sealed environment just meaning that it's not an open air environment but we're breathing out with every exhale 30,000 parts per million so we're putting way more carbon dioxide di dioxide out into the atmosphere and we're slowly breathing in and, and using up that oxygen that's just the way that works in any environment. That happens here. That happens in my van. That happens if I tuck myself under my covers, head and all. I'm going to use up the oxygen in that space and the CO2 level is going to rise as long as I'm in there breathing. This isn't about like breathe into a cloth balloon and uh, see if it'll hold the CO2 indefinitely. No, the CO2 is going to go out, but there is CO2 being added. And the question is, is the CO2 being added at a rate that exceeds the equalization of the pressures. So I'm inside my house. There is less carbon dioxide outside my house than there is inside my house right now. If we all run around in here doing the hokey pokey, exhaling like crazy with all the windows shut and the CO2 level goes up to like 4,000 parts per million and then we leave for a day, come back home, it's not going to be 4,000 parts per million. It's going to be well under 1,000. The carbon dioxide is going to go out. But if we run around in here doing the hokey pokey, doing the chicken dance, huh? yeah. get the level up crazy high and then stay in here and leave the window shut, that carbon dioxide level is not going to come back down noticeably and it may continue to rise. It's just the way that works. And this article that I read from the Daily Beast is, is deceptive to say the least. So the oxygen level falls as the CO2 level rises. If somebody like us, some uh, creature like us, is, is, is in that space, consuming, using the oxygen and breathing back out like a lot more, <laughs> many times more, uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, has determined the optimal breathing range with, in terms of oxygen to be between 19.5 and 23.5% and oxygen. So uh, even beyond the 21% that's in the ambient air is optimal. Serious side effects will occur if the oxygen levels are outside the safe zone. And at levels 17% or below, your mental abilities become impaired. I'm going to stop there. There's more in this article, but I'm just going to read one other one. That was from 2019. Listen, every single mask that I have tested, every single one, the oxygen level inside that space around my face, using a little hose that I put on the front of this meter, blocks off this. It doesn't even block it off completely. I'm going to stick this up here just near my mouth, not in my mouth, just up here, just up near my mouth in this little confined space. Every single time I do this, this thing alarms. It's set to go off at 19.5%. And I'm going to read to you what OSHA says about 19.5% and below. Almost always it dips down into the 18% range. And sometimes I've seen it go under 16% with every single mask that I've tried. It alarms all the time. So now this is from a publication, Operational Health and Safety. This article is actually, I think, from 2017, 2016, April of 2016. Carbon dioxide levels and potential health problems indicated below. If you find something from 2020, it's not presented this way. And I don't think that that's on, I don't think that's accidental, but 
you know, that's me speculating. Here they tell you 250 to 350 parts per million background normal outdoor air level. You're lucky if you have that. We don't. Uh, it's over 400, closer to 500 in the city. Not great air around here. 350 to 1,000 parts per million typical level found in occupied spaces with good air exchange. That means actually having the air completely changed out. We're going to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to mention something about operating rooms um, a little later on. So with good air exchange. Now, it's a good place to mention that most residences do not have actually, uh, don't have air exchange happening. When you're using your air conditioning, when you've got central air, it's not usually hooked up to a fresh air system. Now, newer ones are, people who've spent more money on the air conditioning systems are that way. Our houses were all built in the 60s and 70s. Few people have updated them short of maybe putting in new ductwork and changing out their, um, their air conditioning units outside and possibly changing the condensers inside. But they're not going any further than that. And uh, you've got your house shut up, windows closed here in the deep south. It's hot and humid. You don't want your doors open all the time. You're not bringing in fresh air. It makes your air conditioner work harder. You're using more electricity, and the electricity down here is very expensive from the electric company. And so you're just recirculating. It's going into your return air, and then it's just being cooled, conditioned, dehumidified, and then pumped back out into your house again. So it's just pulled in from the house and pumped back into the house, pulled in from the house. And the only thing that's actually leaving the house is not any exhaust air uh, when you're using air conditioner, just the uh, the condensate, the condensation that's built, that's being pulled out is, is, is uh, exit. I'm, why am I telling you all about air conditioners? <laughs> anyway, uh, good air exchange is not typically happening residentially. Uh, commercial buildings are required to have air exchange. And depending on what they're being used for and how many people are in the space, uh, there's regulations stipulating how many air changes an hour have to take place. So we'll get into that a little bit. Anyway. 1,000 to 2,000 parts per million is a level associated with complaints of drowsiness and poor air. 2,000 to 5,000 parts per million is a level associated with headaches, sleepiness, people feeling like they're breathing stagnant, stale, stuffy air, poor concentration, lack of attention, increased heart rate, and slight nausea may be present. It's actually hard to find anything that, I mean, for me it's been hard to find anything that has been published in, in uh, 2020 that talks about these sorts of problems with air 2,000 to 5,000 parts per million carbon dioxide. But if I go prior to uh, January of uh, 2020 or December of 2019, I meant to say, then uh, I find this information all over the place. So above 5,000 parts per million. We're talking about 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 parts per million with every single mask almost. I mean 98% of the time, probably 99% of the time that I've done a test with a mask of any kind, I get levels above 10,000 parts per million. So above 5,000 parts per million, this indicates unusual air conditions where high levels of other gases could also be present. Toxicity doesn't create, doesn't, doesn't cause uh, carbon dioxide poisoning. It creates toxicity. Toxicity, oxygen deprivation could occur. This is the permissible exposure limit for daily workplace exposures, 5,000 parts per million, averaged out for an eight hour day. And then at 40,000 parts per million, this level is immediately harmful due to oxygen deprivation. So, those are some things about carbon dioxide and their dangers. Uh, did I read this? Paragraph D, section two, subsection three of the Respiratory Protection Standard OSHA considers any atmosphere with an oxygen level below 19.5% to be oxygen deficient and immediately dangerous to life or health. So. Human beings must breathe oxygen to survive and begin to suffer adverse health effects when the oxygen level in their breathing air drops below 19.5% oxygen. At concentrations of 16 to 19.5%, if you're engaged in exertion, you can become rapidly symptomatic. I think I read that. Anyway, it was worth reading again. So, uh, when you don't have enough oxygen, you can end up suffering from hypoxia. Do I think most people are suffering from acute hypoxia? No, I don't. But 
when I was looking into carbon dioxide, I was trying to understand what takes place here. Uh, I've done tests where I'm trying to find out the relation uh, between the elevated CO2 levels inside this confined space around my face and uh, the depletion of oxygen. And it's not a perfect uh, correlation. I find that the elevated CO2 level, that's a steady rise. It might come down a little by a couple hundred parts per million and then, and then continue to rise, but it's a steady elevation to that 10,000 range and then you know who knows how much further. I do find that with the oxygen meter inside the mask, the level kind of goes up and goes down and goes up and goes down and I'm not breathing out the same amount of oxygen. I don't know exactly what's going on there, but I'm trying to you know, follow along as to what might be taking place. Well, that just really led me into reading a little bit about uh, the interaction with these gases. There's um, partial pressures to understand, there's atomic weights or atomic mass to understand, and um, I'm just going to, uh, I'm just gonna, for me, this for me, this debunks this idea that um, carbon dioxide can't build up inside the mask. I want to talk a little bit about how carbon dioxide does in place, does in fact displace oxygen. So if you just want to talk about, I'm not going to get into partial pressures, but I will talk about atomic mass. So our air that we breathe is made up of somewhere in the neighborhood of about 78% nitrogen. So that's a single molecule. And that I think nitrogen is 14. Uh, that's, our, that's the atomic uh, mass, 14. And then oxygen is 16 uh, for one oxygen molecule. But the oxygen that we're breathing in in gaseous form, that's O2, right? And so O2 is two oxygen molecules, and so the atomic weight is 32. Carbon is only 12, uh, but when you are looking at CO2, now you've got three molecules, it's two oxygen and one carbon, and that's 44. So it is, there's more mass uh, in carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide does very effectively displace oxygen. And I've also found, you know, I've, my assumption is that it would, but that you can verify that carbon dioxide also displaces nitrogen. So percentage inside your air, 78% nitrogen, 1% argon. I don't remember what the atomic weight of argon is. It's kind of irrelevant, frankly, because we're talking about 1%. There's trace gases like helium and hydrogen. We know that they're lighter gases, uh, but what matters most is the gases that we're talking about. And then I think the other one that matters most, excuse me, we're talking about uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide, but also uh, I think nitrogen matters because it's what makes up most of our air. Carbon dioxide being breathed into the mask at 30 to 40,000 parts per million at uh, three to four percent being exhaled is displacing the other air that's inside the mask. If it can displace oxygen, it of course can displace nitrogen. Uh, does it displace the nitrogen maybe first, a little bit more rapidly so that you don't necessarily see such a precipitous drop in the oxygen level? Although I do find that it is quick. But carbon dioxide only makes up 0.04 to 0.05% of the air that you're breathing. Um, so, I'm just trying to, uh, well, I told you that it does. You can look that up for yourself. Does carbon dioxide displace oxygen? Does carbon dioxide displace nitrogen? Uh, if you just kind of Google that question, uh, you find all stuff, all kinds of stuff about how masks are safe. It's kind of interesting how that works, what that, how that algorithm is set up. I mean, play around with that a little bit for yourself. If I did screen sharing, I'd show you some of the results I get. I ask questions that are completely unrelated uh, on, on their face. And only somebody who's actually trying to understand this better, like I am, and actually research and dig in, uh, is going to be asking these sort of questions regard, you know, related to masks. And there's all sorts of other reasons to ask these questions and uh, you get uh, masks are safe, masks are safe. So I try to think about other ways to look into this. And uh, what I ended up with was uh, looking into why do CO2 fire extinguishers work? And I found some very interesting articles and I actually, well, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to find them, 
but I found some very interesting articles uh, talking about why these fire extinguishers work and that they rapidly, oh, where did I put that? Gosh, I wish I could find it. Well, anyway, CO2 rapidly displaces oxygen and smothers a fire. You need to have fuel, you need to have uh, heat, I guess, but you need to have oxygen and without oxygen the fire is going to go out and so you can have a fire blazing and you can use a CO2 fire extinguisher and it puts out the fire because it just displaces enough oxygen that it just chokes the fire and the fire can't survive. So uh, that's, just a, that's just another way to think about it. Why inside a confined space around your face the carbon dioxide that you took in uh, maybe to begin with when you first put the mask on at you know something like four to six hundred parts per million but now you're breathing out 30,000 to 40,000 parts per million into this space and this gas carbon dioxide displaces the nitrogen that's in here at 78 percent and the oxygen that was in here to begin with at 21 percent it displaces that air and it does fill up inside this space making it harder to breathe uh, I, I don't know how else anybody could see that. It's a completely logical understanding of the way this works. Anyhow, I'm not going to talk too much longer about it. I've talked about the dangers of breathing in poor air. I'm just going to talk a little bit now about respiratory acidosis and I am not going to pretend that I fully understand this, but hypercapnia, uh, the origin of the word Greek hyper, above or too much, capnos meaning smoke, also known as hypercarbia or CO2 retention. It's just all that is. And I've looked at this in a number of different, uh, a number of different sources explaining it. All hypercapnia is, we're not talking about, there's acute, there's chronic, we're not talking about a specific set of symptoms, we're not talking about a event that puts somebody in the hospital, we're just simply talking about, on the most basic level, what is hypercapnia? It's abnormally elevated carbon dioxide levels in the blood, abnormally. Abnormally elevated, it could be a little bit elevated or, just, or a lot elevated, but just abnormally elevated. Carbon dioxide is, the, is a gaseous product of the body's metabolism and is normally expelled through the lungs. Carbon dioxide may accumulate in any condition that causes hypoventilation or a reduction of alveolar ventilation, which is the clearance of air from the small sacs of the lung where the gas exchange takes place. Now, in here it's going to talk mostly about uh, what, are what are being called diseases uh, causing hypercapnia and then they jump right into talking about acute hypercapnia or acute hypercapnic respiratory failure and uh, that's really all it talks about this is this is in Wikipedia I don't like Wikipedia I always look at Wikipedia because I'm interested to see what's uh, what says what it says there but when you're dealing with an abnormal level of carbon dioxide in your blood eventually the body compensates for the raised acidity because you're, you're at your, uh, your, your pH level, your levels are gonna go down. I'll probably find this somewhere, but I think your normal pH is somewhere between 7.35 and 7.45 on a scale from zero to 14, I'm pretty sure. And then as you go up, then you become more base. So like eight, nine, 10 would be more base, more alkaline. And then uh, as you go down, you're more acidic. But, um, Having uh, your blood be acidic, a little bit too acidic, that just means dropping below 7.35. So 7.34, 7.33. Uh, then you're dealing with um, uh, acidosis. Uh, so we'll get into that. But um, eventually the body compensates for the raised acidity by retaining alkali in the kidneys, a process known as metabolic compensation. I'm not gonna read all of this stuff that I have uh, saved I've got all sorts of stuff saved in documents that I printed up in case I can't find the websites again. And you know, um, to just understand the process that's going on there for the body to uh, 
go through this metabolic compensation with the kidneys and, and what sort of problems might occur in your kidneys. I mean, I'm not even going to get into all of that. There's a lot, this is just sort of pointing you in a direction uh, and, and explaining to you some of the research that I'm doing to try to follow what's actually going on inside our bodies when this is going on. So respiratory acidosis is a state in which decreased ventilation. Now they're talking about decreased ventilation. I'm not going to get into all of that. The point is that we end up with an increased concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood that decreases the body's pH, a condition generally called acidosis. And of course, acidosis occurs in varying degrees. It doesn't have to be something like super traumatic and precipitous and you crash and go to the hospital. It doesn't have to be that way. Carbon dioxide is a product that is being produced continuously as the body's cells respire and this CO2 will accumulate rapidly if the lungs do not adequately expel it through alveolar ventilation. So, you know, if, if you're not adequately expelling your carbon dioxide, then that will lead to a increased PaCO2, that's the partial, partial pressure of CO2, you have you're, the buildup of CO2 in your blood. And that in turn, um, increases your pH, decreases your pH, I'm sorry, makes you more acidic. And it talks about acute respiratory acidosis and chronic respiratory acidosis. Uh, doesn't really say much about it. You can look into that and it talks about causes for acute or chronic respiratory acidosis. And here on Wikipedia, which is what I'm looking at at the moment, it really just sort of focuses in on uh, disease, not necessarily mechanical problems, although it does talk about um, when I say mechanical, like some external uh, problem causing it, but it does talk about that somewhere. I might not even read this any further. Yeah, um, there was something else I wanted to read. It was a little clearer. This is from a health uh, publication. A health publication, not from 2020. <laughs> Where was when was this? 2017. I'm not accepting their cookies, so I have to read around something. Respiratory acidosis is a condition that occurs when the lungs can't remove enough of the carbon dioxide produced in the body. I'm not telling you exactly how this works. I'm asking questions and trying to put puzzle pieces together. But for me, it starts with knowing that inside the confined space around my face, the carbon dioxide level does rise and at least according to publications that were out there prior to 2020, the levels that I see on here are dangerous. Respiratory acidosis is a condition that occurs when the lungs can't remove enough of the carbon dioxide, CO2 produced by the body. Excess CO2 causes the pH of the blood and other bodily fluids to decrease, making them too acidic, so not just your blood. Normally the body is able to balance the ions that control acidity. This balance is measured on a pH scale from 0 to 14. Acidosis occurs when the pH of the blood falls below 7.35. Normal blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45, so it's going to drop below 7.35 to be considered acidic. And you're in a state of acidosis. Respiratory acidosis is typically caused by underlying disease or condition. So, I mean, that's telling you it's, it's a disease but whatever, it doesn't have to be disease. Normally the lungs take in oxygen and exhale CO2. Oxygen passes from the lungs into the blood. CO2 passes from the blood into the lungs. However, sometimes the lungs can't remove enough CO2. Now I have also looked into all sorts of reasons why you're not removing enough CO2. I'm not even gonna get into that. I'm just telling you, you can look into it for yourself. I wanna be careful what I say. CO2 passes from the blood into the lungs. Sometimes the lungs can't remove enough CO2. This may be due to a decreased respiratory rate or a decrease in air movement. Talks about conditions that you could be suffering from. Because of course everything's about disease that needs a pharmaceutical. So, you know, that's the angle that's uh, presented most of the time. Of course, you can find out the other reasons. You just gotta look for them. Forms of respiratory acidosis. There are two forms of respiratory acidosis, acute and chronic, and I found this part really interesting. I'm just, I'm just asking you to look into it and think for yourself. So of course, acute respiratory acidosis occurs quickly. It's a medical emergency. Left untreated symptoms will get progressively worse and it can become life-threatening. 
chronic respiratory acidosis develops over time when our the pH of our blood is too low just just anywhere below 7.35 you're in a state of acidosis according to this I'm reading it straight from here from this Healthline article from 2017 over time this chronic acidosis can develop it doesn't cause uh, symptoms. Now it's funny that it says it doesn't cause symptoms, then it gives you some. But the point is, instead the body adapts to the increased acidity. Because it's not a precipitous drop in pH, it's maybe just under the threshold of what's normal blood pH, and it can increase if you're having whatever the condition is, whether it's an internal disease or if it's some sort of external mechanical condition, potentially, um, your acidosis can get worse. Your pH level in your blood can continue to drop. Developing over time, not causing symptoms that you notice. Instead, the body adapts to the increased acidity. For example, the kidneys produce more bicarbonate to help maintain balance, and you can look into kidney function. I mean, this is, this, I'm going here in my research, okay? I'm trying to understand the function now of the kidneys. And then I'll cross-reference and see what we're being told the boogeyman causes because there's all sorts of problems. You can have pink eye, diarrhea, there's multi-system inflammation syndrome. They're telling us now that the boogeyman causes in kids and uh, there are inflammation all over their bodies and they're dying. And I'm not making light of that. That's terrifying. I have had uh, kids in the hospital and I'm not making light of that at all. But we're being told that everything under the sun is from the boogeyman, including brain problems, heart problems, kidney problems. So, you know, this is the sort of stuff that I want to understand what's going on. If we're in a state of chronic acidosis, which may be, resp may be caused by a respiration problem, respiratory acidosis, what's then maybe going on with our kidneys? And are we dealing with some issues with that? I want to understand that. And so I'm looking into that right now. That's one of the things that I'm doing. Chronic respiratory acidosis may not cause symptoms, developing another illness, so if something else happens to tax your body, I guess is what they're saying, may cause chronic respiratory acidosis to quickly worsen and become acute respiratory acidosis, which happens, again, quickly. It's a medical emergency, left untreated symptoms get progressively worse, and it can become life-threatening. So the symptoms of respiratory acidosis, headache, anxiety, blurred vision, restlessness, and confusion, um, as well as shortness of breath. Without treatment, other symptoms may occur, sleeplessness or fatigue, um, being lethargic, delirium or confusion, um, an increase in your, in your feeling of shortness of breath and possibly a coma. And then it talks about the chronic form of respiratory acidosis, typically not causing any noticeable symptoms. Signs are subtle, nonspecific, and may include memory loss, sleep disturbances, and personality changes, which I think is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, I have another article here talking about how, well, this is worth reading. The bottom line, N95 mask might be uncomfortable and restrictive to the point where it affects your oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. This is from explore health and they're telling you that the N95 might be uncomfortable and restrictive to the point where it affects your oxygen and carbon dioxide but you really shouldn't be wearing that anyway as for cloth faith coverings either store-bought or homemade there's even less chance of breathing issues and it's definitely not an excuse for going out without one and then it goes on to say if you continue to feel like your airways are cut off consider other possible corners causes such as a panic attack which can trigger sudden feelings of suffocation and breathlessness. Isn't that, isn't that really interesting that you can blame your shortness of breath on a panic attack and respiratory acidosis can give you feelings of anxiety and shortness of breath. It's like blaming one symptom on another symptom and never touching on what the underlying cause is, potentially. I mean, that's something I think is possible anyway. Again, I'm not giving you medical advice. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not an expert. 
I'm not an expert at all. Let's see, how are we going to wrap this up? I don't really have much else to say. Um, oh well, this is interesting. I was reading a little bit about how our body does in fact regulate our metabolism, change the pH, and there's, the, uh, there's a concept called uh, dead space, and uh, it's pretty interesting. It's just this idea that as we inhale um, air around us, not all of that air makes it into our lungs for the gas exchange, and some of that is uh, quote unquote wasted, and so we don't actually take all of that oxygen down in and it's inside our airway. And then we're breathing through that dead space. And depending on how we breathe, there's more or less dead space. And that's part of the way that regulating the way we're breathing. Again, fast or slow, deep or shallow. Uh, that's, that's how our body decides to exhale more carbon dioxide or, or um, ret retain some carbon dioxide to adjust pH. So it's a very interesting idea. This dead space talking about uh, having to breathe through, like say for example, a snorkel tube. Now you've extended that, um, that space where you have air that you've not actually brought in for the gas exchange and you've got more dead space to breathe through. And it's actually really interesting uh, to kind of understand how that works and how that can work when you, you, you have your, um, your breathing space limited as opposed to having it extended. Anyway, just another thing that I've looked into. And I wanted to mention about N95s. I didn't realize it at first in my video I showed that one of the masks that I had picked up years ago from Home Depot and have them sitting in a box somewhere and they stink to high heaven like chemicals and I don't like wearing them. Pretty much don't ever. Anyway, um, they're actually N95s. I didn't know that, but they're valved N95s. And I've read two articles now telling you why you should not wear a valved N95 because it doesn't protect you against a virus. And other people have done this. Uh, Brian from High Impact Vlogs, he makes t-shirts showing you that right on the box of the masks it tells you that they don't protect you against virus. And we're told by uh, the government agencies that the reason we wear a mask, I wear it for you, you wear it for me. It's not about me protecting myself, but I'm protecting you because I'm stopping some of my spittle from going out. And I, tell me, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never read anything about what's coming out of your nose. Everything I've read is that people aren't supposed to sing when you're talking. You've got more uh, stuff coming out of your mouth, and, and it's, uh, it's all about the mouth. So why do we need to cover the nose if it's all coming out of the mouth? If the mask, as per the manufacturers of the masks, they come right out and tell you, this will not protect you from a virus. Um, why are they talking about an N95 with a valve not protecting you from the virus anyway? And if it's got a valve on it, I'm not having you know stuff spray straight out with the valve, I don't think. But uh, I've read how the N95s are more restrictive compared to fabric counterparts. I just read something like that for you here. I've actually found the opposite. Uh, some of the tests that I've done with the oxygen meter and the CO2 meter, I get slightly better results with the N95 and the uh, valve on it than I do with just say like a doubled up bandana, which is not good. Like I get terrible results with that as far as how fast the oxygen percentage drops and the CO2 level increases. So this idea about dead space is very interesting. And one of the things that I see out there, and I've read this a number of places, instead of giving us like real uh, physics, you know, explain to us about the gases and the way they work and, and, and how this process is taking place inside our body and outside in the atmosphere. Somebody's saying, well, uh, they, just give it, they, just give you, they just give you, well, if this is true, then it mu that this must be safe. Well, you know, people who work in operating rooms, you know, they're not passing out and dropping dead. Well, nobody's talking necessarily about passing out and dropping dead immediately. But uh, I had a ruptured Achilles tendon in my orthopedic. They worked on me for seven hours. Uh, he took a break. He didn't work on me for seven hours straight. But that's pretty long. Most surgeries aren't that long. But it made me wonder a little bit about the air uh, quality that's in an operating room. And this is just, I'm just trying to give you some insight if you're listening to this into m me, who I am and what I'm doing. You know, I'm not asking you to put your faith in me or trust me but I want you to understand that if you think I'm just an ignorant idiot, that's fine, you can do that, but ignorance is lack of knowledge. 
Um, I am ignorant, you know. I do have a lack of knowledge. But compared to some people, yeah, I'm not exactly ignorant because this is what I'm spending my time doing. So I looked into what are the regulations for healthcare facilities for the people who manage those facilities. What kind? Of, how do they have to manage the air in an operating room? And what I found was some pretty interesting things. How they have to have 15 air exchanges per hour. That means the air that's inside the operating room needs to be completely removed and new air brought in 15 times in an hour. I've also find some pretty strong evidence that as a rule, you're gonna be looking at greater than 20.9 or 21% oxygen uh, percentage inside an operating room, that they have a tendency to keep that oxygen level more in the neighborhood of 22 to 22 and a half percent and that they can't bring in more than 33 percent one-third of the changed air can be from the outside where even in a city setting you're going to you know hopefully not be seeing more than 600 parts per million of carbon dioxide and when they're bringing that air in i'm sure they're scrubbing it some kind of way i haven't been able to find out if they scrub out the carbon dioxide and they might but even if they don't they're not bringing in that much and that the other two-thirds of the air that they're bringing in in that air exchange 15 times an hour doesn't have carbon dioxide in it. And so the carbon dioxide doesn't have the chance to build up in the space the way that it does in most places. If you go to your Costco, your Walmart, your Home Depot, your local supermarket and you go shopping, even though they're commercial buildings and they've got regulations they've got to follow in terms of their air quality and having uh, ventilation. I worked as a facility manager at a high school and we were over capacity in terms of not what the fire marshal said, uh, we were near capacity. We couldn't go over capacity in terms of how many people we had in our building, counselors, teachers, staff members, students. Uh, so we weren't over in that sense, but we were over in terms of what our building's um, air conditioning system could, uh, could accommodate. Our fresh air intakes were too small. I'm not going to get into all of that. There was all sorts of things that we were dealing with trying to make sure that we had good air quality in that building. And it was a battle. It was a struggle. And we weren't always winning it. So, and in a school setting, it's super important for people to be, well, it's important everywhere, but for people to be able to think straight and not be falling asleep and, uh, you know, maintaining good air quality in that building was, uh, was a battle. So, uh, in an operating room, it's obviously crucial. And so the oxygen level, as far as I can, as far as I can tell in everything that I've read, is higher. And uh, the CO2 level is lower. And the air quality in there is better. And I've also gone so far as to find... Um, there was two different polls that I saw. One was, I believe it was um, cosmetic surgeons. The other one was maybe like orthopedics or maybe, I don't remember what kind of surgeons they were. But uh, I actually found polls where somebody was polling these surgeons to find out if they had the choice not to wear masks in the operating room, would they? And uh, you know how high percentages of them in every case, somewhere between 58 to you know 80%, depending on what who they were talking to and what kind of surgery they were talking about or whatever uh, would, have, would have elect not to wear a mask. And uh, some of there was an, on, on one of those polls, people were giving reasons as to why they wouldn't want to wear the mask, why they would prefer not to wear it. They don't feel like they can breathe very well. Uh, I couldn't find whether or not people have a tendency working in operating rooms to wear the valved N95s. I think you breathe better in those. But... Um, you can also find information as to why surgeons wear masks, and it's not to stop viruses, it's to prevent getting a little spit with bacteria in an open wound on somebody that they're literally standing over and working on. Uh, not spreading it around the room necessarily, but literally dropping a droplet on them as they're talking. You know, we all talk sometimes and have a little spittle. So these are the sorts of things that I'm looking into. This is how I'm spending my resources. This is how I'm spending my time because I want to be told uh, that I have to wear a mask. Well, I need to understand is it actually safe, not just believe somebody who tells me that it is and gives me no good reason to believe it. So my own experience and my own research tells me exactly the opposite. And uh, that's led me on other roads as to what I need to do about it. Because the answer for me and for my family is not to put the damn mask on, is not to mask up.
because I don't believe that it's safe and it is my responsibility to make sure that I'm healthy. It's my responsibility to look after the health and welfare of my kids in the short term and the long term. And that's exactly what I'm doing. And I implore you to do the same. Make your decision, but don't make it based on guilt and don't make it based on the propaganda that you get from the mainstream media because it's deceptive and sometimes it's flat out not true. Anyhow, I'm gonna put some links in the video. Uh, if you have any questions for me about the meters or anything like that, I'd be happy to ask, uh, answer those questions for you if you have seri you know, actual serious questions. I'd like to help somebody as much as I can. I'm not here to give you advice. And that's not what any of this should be construed to be. I am simply sharing with you my own experience and my own research and giving you a little bit of an idea about the conclusions that I've come to. But, you know, if you've seen videos of people using oxygen meters and carbon dioxide meters, believe me or don't, but my experience is the results that those people have showed, I have consistently been able to replicate those, those same, those some, some, same, you know, and, and even not just the same results, but uh, I've tested some things that you would be really shocked about the results that I've come across, I've come up with, with the different things that I've, I've tried uh, covering my face with and then breathing uh, into that space and checking the air quality with these monitors eye-opening to say the least so just don't go blindly you know don't, don't go blindly make your choice but make an educated choice tell them friends truly I hope that you will be well